people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India is the UNSC chair for the month of August and it has been in action right from the day one. Recently, Prime Minister Narendra Modi chaired a virtual high-level open debate in enhancing maritime security. Many prominent personalities, including the Russian President Vladimir Putin, joined the event and appreciated New Delhi for discussing and debating the real issues like trade, maritime security and counter-terrorism the world is faced with. As India heads the United Nations Security Council chair for the month of August, Prime Minister Narendra Modi became the first Indian PM to preside over a Security Council meeting. He chaired a virtual meeting on maritime security that was also attended by key position holders, including the presidents of Russia and Kenya and the Prime Minister of Vietnam. Modi came up with India's five-point framework to make waters across the globe trouble-free and more inclusive. At a time when an evolving global order has become the talk of most discussions, New Delhi has reiterated that a law-abiding movement in sea would be in the interest of all and the world will thrive if laid rules were followed. Despite a WTO rulebook in place, while many countries have imposed barriers citing superfluous internal technicalities, others have brazenly attempted to dominate a region to suppress others. According to India, the world must get rid of it. We maritime trade mein barriers hatane chahiye. Hum sabhi ki samruddhi मैरिटाइम ट्रेड के सक्रिय फ्लो पर निर्भर है इसमें आई अड़चने पूरी वैश्विक अर्थव्यवस्था के लिए चुनौती हो सकती है फ्री मैरिटाइम ट्रेड भारत की सभ्यता के साथ अनादि काल से जुड़ा हुआ है the 15-member UNSC has met on several occasions and has passed several resolutions over maritime security, but this was the first time it was discussed in a holistic manner. Maritime security coming up as an exclusive agenda has many reasons behind it. While countries like China have been trying to bully the Indo-Pacific region, causing troubles for smaller island nations, archipelagos and countries near sea, the likes of Pakistan have used it as a medium to spread terrorism. For the first time, a presidential statement on the holistic concept of maritime security was adopted. Besides piracy, armed robbery and transnational organized crime, the statement reaffirms in categorical terms that the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea 1982 sets out the legal framework for maritime activities. It clearly acknowledges the threat of terrorists and the use of seas to conduct terrorist acts and crimes, like, for example, the Mumbai terror attacks in 2008. Freedom of navigation and safe and secure shipping is also acknowledged. While India's role in the Security Council has been prominent whenever it has been a non-permanent part of the bloc, it has been particularly proactive this time around. It is not just the key meetings it will be chairing this month, but the authorities are also resolute in their endeavours at bringing a much-needed change in the discourse. Apart from maritime security, India has resolved to take key decisions towards peacekeeping and against terrorism. India has also strengthened its case of joining the P5 group, which most of the UN members agree with. The ones who have not been supporting is China, a neighbour which according to experts see India's growth as a threat and its allies or say puppets like Pakistan. Moving on, 
Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan, who has been obliquely referred as conspirer in chief by the Afghan government for what is unfolding in the war torn nation, is now appearing to be openly backing Taliban. In his recent interaction with foreign journalists, Khan suggested President Ghani to vacate his chair in order to have peace in the country. The statement comes amidst Taliban's rapidly expanding territorial control and a dying peace process. Many observers have long believed and said that it is Pakistan that provided the men, material and logistics to Taliban to sustain during their downfall and now is playing an active role in their resurgence. Pakistan Prime Minister says he has been in touch with the Taliban leaders and they are not ready to step forward until Afghan President Ashraf Ghani steps down. While for some the statement does not come as a surprise for they already believed it was Islamabad supporting the Taliban resurgence. Others are wondering who he is speaking for and what his plans for Afghanistan are. political settlement is looking difficult right now and it's looking difficult right now because the Taliban are refusing and we tried I, I persuaded tried to persuade the Taliban this is months back three or four months back the Taliban senior leadership came here and we tried to persuade them to come to some sort of a political settlement the only thing that would stop uh, Afghanistan from descending into uh, anarchy is a political settlement. Uh, but unfortunately, the Taliban, when they were here, they felt that um, they would not, they refused to talk to Ashraf Ghani. Mm -hmm. Their condition is that as long as Ashraf Ghani is there, we are not going to talk to the Afghan government. Pakistan's role in nurturing Taliban is no secret and there have been multiple reports establishing its complicity in the widening insurgency's control in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, Taliban fighters have seized key government buildings in major Afghan cities. They have even released footage of the National Directorate of Security compound and other military units being captured by them. U.S. intel reports say if the Taliban continues to capture territories at this pace, then Kabul would fall in the next three months, pushing things to square one, where it all started in 2001. Although the U.S. along with Kabul's own defense is carrying airstrikes, but that hasn't proved enough in containing the insurgents. In fact, the situation is headed towards a humanitarian crisis. As many as 77,000 Afghan families have already lost their homes. خاصم از جامعه بین المللی و از نهادهای بین المللی امی هست که هر چیز رو در در راستای رسیدگی، ام مواد غذایی، مواد تبرد شده و ام مواد غیر غذایی. که یک رقم بسیار درشت متاسفانه ما در افغانستان شاهد هستیم از بیجاشدگان بیجاشدگان ما را باید کمک و همکاری نمید The peace process an exaggerated phenomenon that has hit top headlines is on the verge of collapsing with no side ready to give in Both Kabul and Washington say the Taliban has been demanding way more than a democratic process can concede Obviously, it is a uh, challenging security environment, uh, and um, were we able, were we confident, um, were we comfortable having a larger staffing presence there, um, we would. Uh, but uh, we are evaluating uh, uh, the threat environment on a daily basis. Uh, the embassy is in regular contact uh, with Washington, with the most senior people uh, in this building, uh, who in turn are a regular contact. Uh, with our colleagues at the NSC uh, and the White House. 
um, on, uh, uh, on this dynamic. Um, uh, but for right now, um, uh, we have been able to continue those uh, core activities uh, that are important for us to, to conduct on the ground. And now it all comes down to one major question before the international community. It is whether they can identify and call out the real force behind Taliban, which by all evidence available in public domain is Pakistan. Or it will continue to drag its feet like it has done before. While the US and its President Biden has been cautioned for its hastened decisions, it is a thing of the past now and a solution needs to come up before it is too late. The Taliban is on a rampage and it is just a matter of time before they restart ruling Afghanistan if the community doesn't intervene with a robust response. Moving on. As Delta variant continues to spread across South Asia, Health experts in the island nation Sri Lanka have warned of a catastrophic crisis if stringent measures were not taken immediately. While the country of 21 million people has had a relatively lower impact of the deadly virus as compared to the other South Asian nations, a recent surge has set alarming bells ringing. Meanwhile, other South Asian states have reported more or less the same status as the previous week except for Bangladesh, which is gradually easing restrictions and is vaccinating the refugees in the world's largest refugee settlement of Cox's Bazar. Island nation Sri Lanka, which sustained the first COVID wave with relative ease and loss, is now witnessing a rapid surge in infections hospitalizations and the deaths induced by the deadly Delta variant. Experts have already shown a red flag and the authorities have obliged by reimposing some of the measures that were lifted in wake of a declining infection rate. Last week, the country had reported the highest number of single-day cases. The health system is severely strained as the current number of hospital beds has been exceeded by the number of hospitalization. Marana Sankhya Vagatta, Eva Gemai, Pahuge Mahitani Dina Deke, Marana Sankhya Vagana Salaka Belvahama, Dalava Shing, Pakata Tundinik Pamana, Miana Pavanata Vakama Pidakini. A tourism dependent country, Sri Lanka, hasn't imposed a complete lockdown yet, but the authorities say they are considering it in view of the rising cases. The island nation has so far vaccinated around 50% of the population with one dose and around 14% with both doses. Government says it has dedicated all its oxygen generation capacity for the COVID patients and other options to enhance the generation or procurement are being explored. Oxygen is a secret. Nirikshane Karno. Vishesh Madhavana Kote Lankave Nipadevane Oxygen Pramane Mulumunin Mapahe Roginge Avashatavate Yudagana Tatekata Vilatino. Mekanisa Ape Idiri Sati Dekaka Kaledi India Vinsha Singapur in Oxygen Genema Sandha Mevan Kote Avasha Katyutu Sudanam Kerlatino. Meanwhile, the government of Bangladesh has started vaccinating vulnerable Rohingya refugees who, according to experts, were at the highest risk of getting infected in the Delta variant wave. Around 48,000 Rohingya aged 55 and above were inoculated this week with the help of the UN agencies. Kalam, kita mari kita lihat sini. 
Yurt gibi. Şey, bayrı zıttı kabuluyor. Ammalı bala kabuluyor. Onu da kirliliği. Observers and aid workers have long warned of a potential humanitarian disaster if there is an outbreak in the camps. And while the number was significantly low before, a recent uptick has been observed recently. The camps have seen around 20,000 cases since the outbreak last year and around 200 deaths. And now in our section of Asia this week, the stories from across the continent that hit the headlines this week. South Korea is implementing for the first time an electronic travel authorization or ETA system for overseas visitors from September as the COVID-19 pandemic forces open the way for a policy previously opposed by country's tourism industry. The Justice Ministry said this system will be a long-term way to preemptively head off any contagious disease as well as limit the number of undocumented immigrants which had risen in the years before the pandemic. Most visa waivers were suspended as the pandemic worsened in April 2020. When border controls ease, the ETA system will be in place to help prevent the entry of infectious disease to the country by requiring travelers to share their previous two weeks of travel history. South Korea will be the fifth country to adopt ETA, an automated system used to identify in advance the eligibility of visitors to enter the country without a visa. Japanese company Nisei has introduced a new soft ice cream in Japan. It has the shape of an old-fashioned circular cream roll. The cream has two layers, brown and white. Soft ice cream, which tastes like pudding when eaten, has a pudding called the Great Buddha Pudding. Nara city, located in the center of Japan, is known as the ancient capital of Japan. It remains a tourist destination with historic buildings and a famous Great Buddha in Todai Temple. Nara o hashin shite iketara. と思っておりまして、奈良で有名なだいぶ様をちょっとモジーフに使わせていただいております。プリンだけではなく、もう一つの柱になるようなものが欲しくて、で、それをソフトクリームで表現したいなと思ったものですから、まず日清さんにソフ
people burnt effigies of a mythical demon king Nepal to mark the Gathe Mangal festival. A number of them belonging to the Nevari community gathered to celebrate the festival that is held annually during the Hindu month of Shravan. While the history of its origins varies in different texts, the essence of victory of good over evil remains the same. Have a look. In the east corner of the Nepal Valley, Bhaktapur town observes this unique festival called Ghati Mangal, where the effigies of a demon king named Ghanta Karna are burned by people of the Nevari community. The festival is held every year during the monsoon month of Shravan. While people have grown up hearing different stories and their versions, there is one popular belief that Gantakarna would mete out atrocities on common people. He would kidnap children and women and would demand ransom. The demon got his name from the bells on his ears, that is Ganta meaning bell and Karna meaning ears. The most intriguing part of the folklore is when he was teased into entering a swamp by frogs who were the only creatures during that era that showed some resistance to his barbarity. He drained and died after it became too late for him to return off that swamp. Another aspect of the story also says that he was beaten to death by stones thrown at him by villagers after he got stuck in the swamp. Despite the infection rate reaching alarming levels in the country, only a few days ago, a huge crowd turned up for the event. An effigy of Ganta Karna is erected using hay straws and other decorative items on streets to be burnt later, marking the victory of good over evil. One of the most important festivals of the Nevari community, it is believed that it brings good fortunes. This festival is also celebrated as a symbol of cleanliness as the garbage inside and outside the house is cleaned. People say the festival is timed favorably to get rid of the insects that breed during the season. अब हमरो घर खेत आगन में तो सफा करेगा, छाली पराल सब सफा करेगा, गठन मगल बनाएं जा, बनाए रहते हैं हर एक वड़ा वड़ा मार टोल टोल में तो इसे लेने जलाएं जा, अन्य जो जलाए पची तो ये उटा तो बेजानी हिसाब रखी पड़े नहीं, अजले को समय में काम पानी को ऐसा अवस्था बरसात को समय में लाम खुजले, अन्य विभिन्� गठमोग जलाया र छाली बाले र पराल बाले र तो इन धुआँ निकाली इंसा धुआँ निकाली से कुछ भी पुरे लाम खुटे उड़ो तो इन भाग सा और जैसे ले तो इन हर एक वर्षा तो इन यो गठमोग बनाया र तो इन छह बालने चल इंसा For centuries, people from all walks of life in the Nivari community have upheld the tradition of this festival. They say such festival symbolizes the spiritual victory of light over darkness, good over evil and knowledge over ignorance. Hindu mythology is filled with such festivals that are based on intriguing tales. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.